G'day gamers, Ranger Tony here with another Solace the Crown of the Magister build video. Today we're going to create a Shadowcaster Rogue. Let's have a look. So, this Rogue is going to be using the Shadowcaster archetype, so you're going to get some spells. So we're going to need a little bit of intelligence for that. And we're going to be dual wielding finessable weapons so we're going to need some decks for that as well what are good races for this well halflings will make reasonable shadow casters but they don't get any intelligence bonus so your best option is the high elf you could also build this as half elf human uh, dwarf any race will do okay but we get bonuses to dexterity and intelligence as a high elf we're also getting protection against charm and immunity to sleep. In early access of Solace the Crown of the Magister, and this is an early access build, in early access, your opponents, if they're spellcasters, arcane spellcasters, they use sleep a lot. And having the immunity to that is brilliant. Okay? You also have dark vision, which is really nice. You have proficiency in perception, which is really nice. Um, you get proficiency with longsword, shortsword, shortbow, and longbow. Not really going to help you a lot with this build because as a rogue, you get most of that anyway. Well, you get shortsword and shortbow. So the advantage of longsword is no good to us because we need finessable. The longbow is going to mean that we can switch to the longbow as uh, an alternative bow to do more damage, but you can get the same amount of damage with a light crossbow. So consider that, which you do have access to as a rogue. We get a high elf cantrip, which will be very important. Um, so let's choose that and move on. We are going for the rogue. Now, just briefly on the rogue archetypes, there is the thief rogue. This one doesn't really do a lot for me. Um, your cunning option allows you to use an object. So it means that normally things like drinking a potion or using objects that would normally take your normal action, you can do as a bonus action now. Um, so that's nice. Second story work just means that you can climb a little bit better than you could and you can jump a little bit further than you could. Both handy, but I don't feel like they make you more of a rogue. I would like to see one of these that does a little bit better at improving damage. Now, Dark Weaver does do that a little bit. You get proficiency with the poisoning kit. Okay. Climbing walls is a little bit easier. You don't get the jump, but you do get the climbing. But you also get an a bonus to damage. You add your proficiency bonus, which at this point is, you know, you start as plus two, to your damage with a ranged weapon if you're shooting an opponent on lower ground. Now... That can be nice. There are a few situations like that, and there might be a few situations where you can, say, climb a wall and shoot down into combat, you know, after the combat started. But mostly, I don't see that as being a huge thing, and it doesn't give you a huge advantage at all. So this is a shadow caster build, and this gives you access to, to some spells, and these spells are gonna give you some advantages. And you get the Shadow Dodge, which you can use once per rest and allows you to teleport up to five cells away. It's not hugely important, but as a rogue, and as a rogue who's going to be concentrating on melee a fair bit, this will allow you to jump out of, t out of the way if you're in a bad spot without having to use Disengage things like that. So it's a bonus action, so you can use it at the very last minute. But you're going to have to remember to use it, because if we're doing two-weapon fighting, your second attack is in that bonus action. So you'll have to forego that second attack to use this. So be aware of that. Okay, so we're, we're going to be choosing that, not yet, not yet, but at the time. Now, the other thing that I would do here, so we get all of this stuff. We get dexterity and intelligence save throw proficiencies. That's nice. Light armor, okay. Um, we get simple weapons, long sword, rapier, short sword, fine. Thieves tools, good. We can pick a bunch of skills here, and we can pick. We can become experts in a couple of those, 
and then sneak attack. So we do an extra 1d6 of damage every two levels, that increases. Uh, to one creature you hit with advantage using a finessable or ranged weapon once per turn. You do not need advantage if an active ally is next to the target. So you always want to be attacking with somebody else, basically. You want to get up there and get next to somebody else who already has an opponent in front of them so that you can use your sneak attack, okay? And you have to be using finessable weapons, which means rapier or short sword or dagger. And to be able to dual wield, you can't dual wield the rapier, so you're going to want to dual wield short swords, okay? They're your best bet for that. Um, now, we're gonna, because of that, we're going to edit the equipment. You start the game with a rapier, short bow, burglar's pack, leather armor, two daggers, and a thieves tool. Now, you could just swap to your two daggers until you can get a couple of short swords. But if you change this to short sword, short bow, burglar pack, leather, two daggers, then what you can do is you can start your layout as short sword and dagger. Right, which I think at the moment it's it's assuming that you're going to use both daggers, but you can start with short sword and dagger as your combination of weapons initially, and move on to dual short swords once you find another short sword, and they're pretty common to find early game, so that wouldn't be a problem. Or you can buy them, of course. So that's my recommendation for the equipment. Let's move on. Backgrounds. Our background here is vital to this build. And we are going to choose Sellsword. Why Sellsword? Okay, proficiency in athletics and intimidation, nice but not great. Proficiency with medium armor. So now you can still be a rogue and use medium armor. You will get disadvantage in sneaking using the medium armor, but that's it. You can still use all of your abilities, cast all of your spells. I've just done a playthrough with essentially this build, and it works fine. Um, the personality flags and the alignment that you choose are entirely up to you. I'm just going to pick the first options there to move forward, but we definitely want Cell Sword. Uh, so basically, with this build, as soon as you can, buy yourself some scale mail armor. That's it's that simple and that will bump your armor class up. Uh, you can get similar armor classes by bumping your dexterity really, really high and um, and wearing leather armor, but this just gives you that little bit of an advantage early on. Later on, you can switch back to leather armor if you want, but early on, this, this is the better way to go. So, uh, ability scores. Like I do with all of my builds, I'm going to give you some general recommendations and then we'll do a quick roll and, and work, work with something. So generally, strength is not important for this build. It's really only going to affect your ability to carry stuff. That's it. And any other say strength-based save throws. So in reality, 10 or above so that you don't have any penalties there is good enough, but you, know, you might want to keep that a little bit higher than 10 if you want to have some extra carrying capacity. Dexterity is your primary attribute. You want this to be at least 16 or higher. Okay, and we're getting a plus two bonus to this. So, you know, we definitely want this as high as possible. It's going to be how you hit with your melee weapons because they're finessable. So that's going to increase your chance to do uh, sneak attacks and uh, it's going to affect your chance to hit with missile weapons as well, which you're not going to rely on as much, but it's still I would still take the chance to take that first shot in combat with a bow of some sort, whether it's crossbow, short bow, long bow, whatever. Take that shot first and then move forward and, and go into attack with your uh, short swords. Constitution is nice to have, but I'm saying you want it positive. You want 10 or higher. Um, anything that you can add in here is going to add to your hit points, which means you're going to stay alive longer. But as a rogue, you're going to try and move through combat a little bit so that you don't get hit as often. Um, but, you know, if you can get this to 14 or even 16, that would be great. 
but 10 plus is enough for the build. Intelligence, you do want. It's not as important as you might think in some cases. You don't need a minimum intelligence to become the Shadowcaster. So technically, you could become Shadowcaster with a penalty to intelligence, but that's going to have a penalty to your hit with your spells. So your spells attack ability to hit the target is based on your intelligence, as is the uh, the DC that they have to roll to um, defend against your uh, spells. So if you have a penalty there, it's going to make that easier for them to save against your spells. So I'm saying you want this to be at least 14, which will give you a plus two. So that will give you uh, a plus two to the spell hit and um, it will make the DC at least 12. Uh, it should be a little bit higher than that based on levels as well, but that you'll, you'll work all that out, see all that as you progress. Wisdom. Look, Wisdom does help with save throws. Wisdom save throws are fairly common. However, we're not going to build that into this build. So if you've got the spare points, use them. But this really just needs to be 10 or higher so you don't have any penalties. And the same for your Charisma. 10 or higher so that you don't have penalties is fine. If you're going for the standard array, then you're, of course, going to want to put... Um, your the, the 15 into dex making it 17 then i would put 14 into your intelligence making it 15 i would probably then move the 13 into constitution the 10 into strength um and then a 10 for wisdom and you could live with an eight for charisma but it's not great um if you're going on the points by system you know then you're going to have a similar sort of situation. Um, I would get all of these to 10 and then go, as I said, to 14 there and then as high as you can there, which will be 17. And you've got five points to spend. I would probably use all of those in Constitution and that would be the, the, the uh, spread I would go with. Um, and then dice rolls, as I said, at least 10 in strength, at least 16 in dex. Uh, whatever you can, extra into con is nice, at least 14 in intelligence, and 10s for the rest. But we're just going to go with this and move on. Proficiencies. Now, we get four class skills. My recommendations, because you've got such a high dexterity, is to go acrobatics, sleight of hand, and stealth. Um, and then either investigation, which you've got a bonus on for intelligence, or you might want, oh, you've already got perception, so we, no, yeah. We already get the bonus to perception as an elf. So we'll stick it in investigation there. Now we can choose to increase our expertise in any of these. There's a couple of ways you can go here. Because you don't have great wisdom, and perception is useful for finding traps, you might want to do that. But I'm going to go sleight of hand. No, sorry. I'm going to go stealth and thieves tools. So that'll make us... The sleight of hand is also for picking pockets, but it's, it's for using your thieves tools to disarm traps as well. So by putting the bonus in there, we also get a bonus to that, essentially. Um... And now we get to choose languages. We get an ancestral language, and then we get one language from our background. I say this in early access, there's only two languages that are important, Terran and import importantly, Old Temerian. So if you've got two languages, pick those two, then go and pick anything else, okay? Um, but everything in this game revolves around Old Temerian, so you want at least someone in the in the party who can speak that um, it doesn't have to be your rogue but i just get everyone to take those two languages if they can spells so this is the cantrip that we learn because we are a high elf we get a we get a cantrip in our ancestry what do we take here there's only one thing i want here and that's dancing lights okay so this creates a light which you can move around um, and you can basically put it next to an opponent to light them up. 
okay? It only lasts for a minute, but the biggest problem you're going to have as a rogue is making sure that you don't have disadvantage when you're attacking an opponent. Now, if they're at a distance, it's let's say it's the start of combat, and you've got your bow out, whether it's a short bow, crossbow, long bow, you've got your bow out. Use your bonus action. No, it's not a bonus action. If you use your action to cast Dancing Light, then next round, that opponent is lit up and you can rush in, uh, you can shoot at a distance and light them up. So it's a nice thing to have. It's not always perfect. The other option is to use light and light up one of your weapons and then just charge in. And then you can be sure that everything's lit for whatever target you're going to hit. But the biggest problem you have is a lot of the time you're fighting underground and even though you have dark vision, the game will say that your opponent is dimly lit, even though they're right in front of you. Okay? So that's one of the things, at least in the early access game, I think needs to be improved. So taking dancing light to light up an opponent at a distance or light that you can use on, because you have to cast that light on an item in your inventory and you can just cast it on one of your weapons, preferably one of the ones that you're going to be holding in combat. So your short swords, for example. And then anything that you attack will be lit up, okay? That's, as I said, that's a big problem early game. You want to fix that if you can, because that's one of the big things that's gonna stop you from being able to do um, sneak attacks. So we take Dancing Lights there. Uh, what you look like and what you call yourself does not matter for this build. So we're just gonna pick the first name and move on. So let's keep leveling up. At level two, all we, well, we get extra hit points. We got an extra seven hit points. Um, as I said, you get, well, maybe I didn't say, but you get eight hit points plus your constitution bonus initially, which would have been 10. And then you get five hit points plus your constitution bonus as a rogue every level thereafter. So that's, we're now at 17. Um, cunning action will allow you to take actions like dash, disengage, or hide as a bonus action rather than taking an actual action. Um, no, actually what it's doing, it's, it's allowing you to turn your action into a bonus action. So normally you can only use one bonus action a turn. This allows you to f sacrifice one of your actions to become a bonus action. Okay, anyway. Um, that's all we get there. Level three. We pick our archetypes. Now I've mentioned this before. We're going down the Shadowcaster route because none of these really help us too much with damage. This one will help us a little bit, but it's mostly, it's subtle, but it, at the moment I feel it's the best way to go with a rogue in Solastar until they bring out some more potential um, archetypes. So as a Shadowcaster, we get some spells. So we get three cantrips and three spells. The cantrips that I'm going to recommend are True Strike. Now, this is the most important one because what this is going to allow you to do is it gives you advantage on the first attack against your opponent. Okay? And it is an action. It's not a bonus action. But you're dual wielding so you can attack as a bonus action with your offhand so you can cast true strike and then immediately attack and that gives you advantage which means because you've got advantage even if you're out in front of an opponent by yourself you will be able to do a sneak attack on them um, so that is really useful the other one, Dazzle, can be useful because it debuffs your opponent. They can't take reactions and they get a minus two to their armor class. So we're going to take that. And the last one is a little bit of uh, range damage dealing, which always hits, but they can save against it, is Shadow Dagger. 
You can't use that, of course, to do a sneak attack, but it is still a nice uh, spell that works from a distance. Always hits, but they can save against it. What spells do we want? Well, the first spell I'm going to recommend is Color Spray. It allows you to blind opponents in front of you in a cone. Um, they then get disadvantages on the attack, which means you have advantage against that opponent, which means you can use Sneak Attack. So just like True Strike, um, another way to get Sneak Attack, but the advantage here is, is that you're setting up multiple opponents to potentially do sneaks attack, Sneak Attacks on in the next few rounds. Um, the next big one that you really, really want is Shield. Uh, if you don't even use Color Spray and, and you know, you can just use shield all the time. Now, you don't actually have to use it. It'll ask you, it'll prompt you if you're just about to be hit whether you want to use shield. My recommendation is use it. In particular, if there are multiple opponents within melee range or multiple opponents within uh, missile range of you and the game prompts you to use shield, use it because it protects you for the rest of the round, or the rest of your opponent's round, it protects you from any, or it increases your armor class by five for the rest of the round. So if there's multiple opponents that can attack you and one swings and is going to hit and it prompts, do you want to take that? Go, yes, please, because it'll protect you from that hit. And if that opponent has more hits to go, and then there's other opponents that have multiple hits, you're going to be protected for all of it. The only time you want to say no is if you're saving it up because you know there's another big fight coming up that you don't have time to rest for, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But my, re my reaction to that is don't wait, use it, okay? Use it or lose it is the, is the kind of mentality. The other spell, the only other spell here that's really any good initially is protection versus good and evil. It doesn't have to be used on you. It can be used on a companion and it does require concentration, which is a bit of a nuisance, right um so that can be a pain but take it even if you never use it it's the best of the other ones so take that so then at level four we get to increase our ability scores or we get to take a bonus feat now increasing our ability is going to help us there's no doubt about that it's going to make it easier for us to hit it's going to increase our damage because we're using finesse based weapons all of that um, but one of the things that i've noticed happens a lot in the game is while you're traveling around you get ambushed when you're camping and there's one feat that you can take to resolve that and that is acute sense senses you cannot be surprised and you always wake up immediately if your camp is attacked while you sleep. So we're going to take that. There are a couple of other feats that could be useful. Um, potent cantrip will mean that your shadow dagger will do half damage if they save against it, which can be useful, but you're not going to rely on that a lot for damage and none of your other cantrips will get any advantage from that. Flawless Concentration would only really help the Protect versus Evil and Good, so I wouldn't worry about that. Enduring Body would be a good one. It gives you an extra hit point per level. Hard to Kill makes you recover uh, potentially easier if you do get down to zero hit points. Um, Sylvan Archer can be okay, but I don't really recommend it for this build. Um, so I'm definitely going to say... And you can take Lockbreaker as well, but you already have advantage when using the the picks, the Thieves' Tools. So don't. Take Acute Senses. Um, or, as I said, it buff your decks. Um, we get another spell. Now, Mage Armor, I haven't explained, but Mage Armor is useless to you because you can't be wearing armor when you use it. Okay? So it gives you an armor class of 13, but you, ha you can't be wearing armor. And we've gone to all this effort to, mean, to make sure that we can wear scale mail. Um, and then if you take that scale mail off and use mage armor, you're going to be worse off than if you had the scale mail on. So don't take that spell. 
Also be aware you can't learn spells from scrolls and you can't cast spells from scrolls yet. At, I think, level 13, you might be able to, but um, you cannot do that yet. So that really only leaves false life, which it gains you a few temporary hit points. I, I never see it as being all that ad advantageous. Um, so my recommendation is going to be take Detect Magic or Identify. And in fact, Identify is probably the more useful one because you just don't know. Uh, well, sorry, no, you do know is what I mean. You do. You often know when an item is magical. Every potion you pick up you ha that you haven't identified, you know you need to identify it. Um, usually there'll be something in the description of the weapon or the, you know, the arrow or the armor or whatever that'll make you think that it's probably enchanted. Don't bother casting Detect Magic on it. Just identify it straight away and then you're fine. So that's my recommendation there but again don't use that spell if you know just as soon as you wake up for the day because you wasted it you've only got very limited spells as a shadow caster it's the end of the day you've got nothing else to do use that to identify equipment if nobody else in the party can level five we get our proficiency bonus increase to three we get an increase to our spell casting, so our DC is increased to 13, plus our intelligence bonus, which would make it 15. Um, and our spell attack is increased to 5. Uh, and we get uncanny dodge. Now, I've not actually seen this work yet, so I'm not entirely sure if it's implemented, but in the early access, there's only one fight that you can do, which is at level 5. So it may just have been that none of my rogues, and I had two rogues in that battle, it might just have been that none of them were in a situation where they were getting attacked. Um, but I didn't see this actually work, so I'm not sure if it's entirely implemented or not yet. But it is a good feature, and you get it automatically. So, yeah. And that is as far as you can go in early access. But we'll continue to level 10. So... Level six, we can become, we can add expertise to two more skills that we've already got. So we, last time we added it to stealth and thieves tools. This time we're going to add it to our other dex ones, acrobatics and sleight of hand. Um, and we'll move on. At level seven, we get our first second level spell. Um, the only one, well, there's three here, and they're, they're all just the top row, basically. Blindness is fairly useful, but it only attacks one target, so be aware of that. Blur protects you for a minute. Yep. And invisibility, um, makes you or an ally invisible for one round. Now, what it's not clear on this is what breaks the invisibility. Um... You have advantage on your attacks, and your attackers have disadvantage when you are invisible. But it doesn't explicitly say that attacking makes you visible again. That's how the spell has always been, but I have not used it yet because you can't get to level 7. Uh, I've not used it yet to see how it's been implemented to be sure that that's actually worked. Maybe they, once they get out of early access, they will change the description to be more useful but for now um that's that i'm going to recommend taking so for now i'm going to recommend taking blur uh, it's a slightly better protection for you initially at level eight we get an extra spell and we get to either do abilities or Feats. This time I'm going to do the ability score increase. Um, if you did it previously, you know, you want to get your dex to 20 as soon as you can. After that, don't bother with ability point increases. Um, so the other spell here I would then take would be invisibility. And then finally at... Not finally, but at level 9 we don't get anything except more hit points, which is nice. 
And so at level 10, we get one more spell and I would take blindness at that point. So here is our level 10 High Elf Rogue Shadowcaster. We are doing uh, plus seven to hit with uh, one to six plus four damage. Um, we can do sneak attacks once per round. We can wear medium armor, even though we're not gonna start with that. So some gameplay notes. First of all, the real advantage of two weapon combat is that it allows you to do a sneak attack on that second attack, okay? So if you miss on your first swing, take the second swing because if it hits and everything is set up correctly, you can do the sneak attack on that. You do not have to do anything to trigger a sneak attack, unlike, say, Baldur's Gate 3, where you have to say, this is going to be a sneak attack. It just happens automatically. If everything is set up correctly, it'll be a sneak attack, okay? Um... So if your first attack misses, you've got that opportunity of the second attack to do the sneak attack. If your first attack hits, then you can't do a sneak attack on the second because sneak attacks, you only get one sneak attack per round. Okay, so if the sneak attack fires on the first, don't worry about it on the second, which means, secondly, that if that does happen, if you use a sneak attack in your first attack, consider doing something different than attacking with your bonus action, okay? There might be more advantage to drink a potion or heal somebody else with a potion or to do one of the other actions that you can do in a bonus action, okay? Because, which includes dashing or disengaging or whatever because you're not going to do as much damage with that second attack. So be a little bit strategic with it and think about it. It might be the perfect opportunity to heal an, a companion or help raise them up, you know, get them up if they've been knocked down to zero hit points or what have you. So, as we can see here, initially use a short sword and dagger, but as soon as you can, you're aiming to use two short swords because they do 1d6 rather than 1d4 of damage, okay? Just give you that little bit better damage all round. But if you want to be a little bit different, two daggers is perfectly fine. I actually finished the playthrough of my Shadowcaster wielding two daggers because we found a magical dagger and that was in my main hand. And it worked perfectly fine. Um, you just don't do as much damage with your offhand. Um, get that scale mail as soon as you can. Get the medium armor as soon as possible, okay? because you want that increase in your AC. Um, use dancing lights or lights, whichever one you chose as your high elf cantrip. Use that to make sure that everything is lit up well so that when you go to attack, you don't have disadvantage because if you have disadvantage, you cannot sneak attack. Use true strike. If you can't get advantage any other way, use True Strike to be sure that you get advantage, okay? And True Strike is your main attack, and then use your offhand attack to see if you can get the sneak attack. Use the shield spell whenever prompted if you're being attacked by a large group of enemies, particularly if they're close around or if there's a lot of archers that are concentrating on you. Okay, use that spell because it protects you for the rest of the round. Every other opponent that tries to attack you will have to roll five points higher because it gives you an increase in AC of plus five. It just, it makes sense. Whenever that pops up and says, do you want me to do it? Just have a quick look. Are you surrounded by enemies who can either do melee or missile attacks? Are there, and also where are you in the initiative queue? Are you right at the start or are you right at the end? Are there lots of opponents that can come for the rest of the round and attack you, all right? If you're right at the end of the round, it's not gonna help you because they've already, well it is, it, yeah. Just look and see how many opponents can attack you for the rest of this round. Um, and if there's a lot, then then use it. But if, if the 
per, if the creature that's attacking you was the last one in the initiative list for the round and they attack and it says do you want to do it take a chance and maybe not do it uh, depending on what your health is at too if your health is really low well you know no it's a no-brainer um and finally move to attack opponents that are threatened by your companions that's to give you the best chance to do attacks of opportunity yes you can light up your opponent yes you can use true strike yes you can use color spray to blind them all of those yes you can use dazzle all of those might help you get advantage and make that sneak attack but if you're standing next to an opponent who is also being attacked or being threatened by that enemy and you can attack that enemy and as long as you don't have disadvantage you will do a sneak attack so always try and move around stick with the group don't ever attack don't ever run off and attack alone if you do use true strike but if you you know if you don't want to do that keep with the group make sure that you stay there to get the best chance at doing sneak attacks and if you look at it and a sneak attack didn't go off work out why it'll usually be lighting will be the big difference okay so I hope you enjoyed this build of the uh, High Elf Rogue Shadowcaster. If you did, leave some comments down below and stay tuned for more build videos. Thanks a lot. Bye.